Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sharon Gao Show. The Sharon Gao Show is a space where I have conversations with brilliant minds who are passionate about nutrition, well-being, and healthy living. Transform your health, you can transform your life. So today, our guest is Sarah Willis. Sarah is a passionate leading expert in sustainable and humane livestock farming and our food system. Since 2006, Sarah has worked diligently with organizations like the Animal Welfare Institute's Farm and Welfare Program to help them raise awareness about the atrocities of conventional industrial livestock production and showcase high quality, humanely produced alternative options. She is a significant contributor to the sustainable food movement, doing everything from speaking on panel at Stanford University to participate in guest conversations on Martha Stewart Radio. Sarah's work promotes positive change, helping customers identify healthy, humane, and sustainable purchasing options that align with their values. Oh, my friend, this is, sounds so impressive. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Wow, thank you so much for such a, a wonderful introduction. I really appreciate having me on your show. I, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Thank you so much. So our topic today is about meat. So meat, is it good or bad? That is a topic that we hear a lot about these days, um, especially with the advent of more um, completely plant-based diets. I know there are a lot of people who have decided to choose a more vegan or plant-based diet. Um, and I think that in many ways that is very healthy, but also, um, we need to remember that uh, meat is a very important part of our diets as well. Mm -hmm. um, meat actually provides a lot, it's, it's a powerful punch. It packs a lot of um, nutrients for us in our diet. Um, it's actually the single best source of protein, um, but it's also really important to understand that there's a difference between the different kinds of meats that are available for us out there. So, um, when you're when you're if you're deciding to integrate meat into your diet i think it's really important that still your diet remain mostly plants um but i don't think that um meat is necessarily um bad for you it's actually really really good for you um one of the big myths about eating meat is that it increases cholesterol levels and science has shown over the past three decades that it actually does not increase your um, cholesterol levels, your bad cholesterol levels or in good cholesterol levels in your blood. Um, they've actually found out that, um, you know, saturated fat has no real impact on your blood cholesterol levels. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the things that really does have a, um, an impact on your blood cholesterol levels are uh, sugars, carbohydrates, processed foods, mm -hmm. starch, refined starches. Those things actually do raise your blood levels of bad cholesterol and the bad saturated fats. Um, and a really great resource to look at is, um, you know, there are lots of good re resources online where you can find the science behind this, but I really am a big fan of Dr. Mark Hyman, and um, he's a very well-known functional doctor. Yeah. Yes, and he's written several books on this subject, and he's a huge advocate for understanding, you know, the different types of food that we put into our body and how important how important it is to know where they come from. So, um, but I think it's really important when we talk about meat, whether it's bad or good for you, there, you can't put a blanket statement over it. Um, I think it's, it's, it's not as simple as that because there's yeah. more than one type of meat. Yeah. And you'll see when you go grocery shopping, mm -hmm. you know, all these different options are available for you, whether yeah. grass fed, organic, all natural. Um, what do these different terms mean and how does that impact, you know, the meat that you're putting into your body? Absolutely. So I guess, you know, it, 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 it is a really, um, 
controversial subject about eating meat, right? Because so many theories out there, it's almost conflicting with each other. So for us, like, what do we really believe, right? So I think the famous one is the China study indicates the correlations between animal protein uh, with like uh, chron chronic disease, right? So it indicates animal proteins directly lead to chronic disease based on China study. Now it has been like the theory that a lot of plant based uh, you know, whole foods died based on. But uh, yeah, like uh, lots of other experts also say we need to eat whole foods, exactly the one like you, what you were talking about. It's, 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 there is no absolutely study proof that meat is definitely bad, you know, no matter what kind of meat. Right. And I think it's important to recognize, you know, we're all connected. Everything in nature is connected. And human beings um, are omnivores. We're, we are not, um, you know, we're not carnivores. We're actually omnivores. We're not, we're not meant to just eat plants either. And also, we have to think about the bigger picture. Um, you have grazing animals who have been a part of the landscape and our environment for um, as long as the, the earth has been around. And if you start like kind of picking out those things, it really impacts our environment as well. If everyone were to actually stop eating meat, you would run out of um, a natural fertilizer. There's a natural connection between the, the, the animals that are roaming on our landscapes it's the and natural plants ecosystem. that are growing there as well. What? It's a natural ecosystem. It's a natural ecosystem. It's a circle of life. Um, there's a really wonderful farmer too who has a farm out um, on the East Coast um, and his name is Joel Salatin. I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but um, he's written a lot of books about it and he has totally revised his entire farming operation to really emulate the nature's own patterns. So when he has the cattle go through and grazing a pasture, mm -hmm. uh, after the cattle go through, then the chickens go through because the cattle leave their, um, they defecate on the pasture and yeah. there are insects and things like that that really thrive. And then the chickens go through and they eat the insects and then the pigs go through. And so it's a really wonderful um, mimic of what what nature does and yeah. how we all kind of work together and um you know i guess that's a bigger picture but if you're talking about like meat and some of the big things to look for when you're looking for meat and, and the healthy aspect that it's going to have on your overall health um i think the most important thing is to know that the meat that you're eating was grass-fed or pasture raised mm -hmm. um that it wasn't you know, raised in a factory farm. And when I say factory farm, that's also a very um, controversial uh, descriptor. We're actually talking about industrially raised right. meats. And that can be chicken, it can be beef, it could be pork. There's so many um, an animals that are now being raised in confinement. And that means actually over 99% of all of the meat that's produced is raised in a confinement type situation. And that means the animals are packed densely packed indoors where they don't have enough to move room to move or behave naturally mm -hmm. and because they're raised in this type of environment oftentimes they need to be uh, fed a continual diet of antibiotics so that that can keep them alive and kind of help them grow a little bit faster and come to market faster yeah so this i think is, that's also the reason that people are scared of eating meat because of those type of industrialized the farming you know the the sources of meat right so if animals have antibiotics even for not just talking about meat, uh, even just for plants, right? If the soy already has antibiotics, right? So the things that we grow in that farm and the things we are going to eat later, we are going to absorb on those antibiotics as well. So it's like, it's, that's why people are very sensitive to talking about, you know, uh, eating meat and, uh, you know, so like exactly the reason you were talking about earlier. That's right. I mean, you point out a really, really important factor that a lot of a lot of times gets overlooked um, is just the fact that because the antibiotics are laced into the feed that the animals are being fed, it later gets spread out on the on the land as fertilizer, but it 
uh, oftentimes has um, an opposite reaction with the soil because of the antibiotic residue, and it can actually affect the micro uh, biome of the soil. We all oftentimes talk about the microbiome within our gut, mm -hmm. the microbiome. Even, there's actually an, one on our skin as well, yeah. but there's a, a very important one in our soil. Soil is actually a living, um, a living thing, and that provides nutrients to the grains. That's the only thing for only eat. foods, right? That's the yeah. only thing. Like if only if that part is organic and is healthy and, and then the, the rest of the chain of the foods can be safer, you know. Otherwise, yeah, but but I guess we live in big cities nowadays, and we are buying foods from big grocery stores. We really, we rarely understand how our foods actually come from. You know, sometimes we buy kiwis from Australia. You know, we <laughs> have no idea like how the farm in Australia, you know, operate. You know, so that's why we just like. You know, it's it's really, but I think it's also very very important, like to be mindful to really understand like the relationships between our food and the sources, right? It's the same right. for eating meat. As it well. is so important, and mm -hmm. it, you know, it has a huge effect on the nutrients in the food that we eat. So a lot of the food that's being produced today doesn't have the same, you know, denseness of nutrients as was grown, you know, a hundred years ago. Yeah. Um, because our, because a hundred years ago, industrial farming was just, you know, barely get getting started and all of the farming was traditional outdoors on pasture and all the animals had plenty of room to move and behave naturally. Crops were, you know, rotated because that's been a practice that has been put in place for centuries as a very, um, yeah. wonderful practice. So Once back in there, everything was organic because there is no pesticides, no chemical right. fertilizer. Everything is like natural fertilizer, right? So there's no right. Pollution. So it was organic. But nowadays, like because of all these uh, industrialized uh, operations, then our foods really, like you said, not just the only lack of nutrients, but it's full of pollutant. You know, so that is very, very uh, important to, to know. So you said that, uh, I, I know you grew up on a ranch and your father also farm, raising livestock humanely and sustainably without, without using antibiotics. So can you share with us more about it? Yes, so I grew up in Thornton, Iowa, which is a very small town in north central Iowa. Um, I grew up on our family's farm. We raised pigs outdoors on pasture and in deeply bedded pens. Mm -hmm. They had plenty of room to move and behave naturally. We were raising them this way because it was a way that was passed down through our family. Um, so I'm a fifth generation farmer if I was farming right now. And I have been involved in our family's farming operation um, and just recently relocated to California where I got to meet you. But um, yeah, so we were raising our animals like that, and um, things started to change in the 1980s, and we noticed people were building these um, industrial production units. They're called confined animal feeding operations, and people will say for short, they use the acronym CAFO. And a confined animal feeding operation for hogs can hold up to 2,500 pigs in it without being considered oversized. Mm -hmm. and it's only the size of a football field, just to give you some perspective wow. on how big it is. And these um, buildings often have, or they, they always have cement slatted floors so that the manure can pass straight through to a deep manure pit, pit underneath where the manure pit will collect millions of gallons of um, pig or, or livestock excrement, mm -hmm. along with a lot of other chemicals or anything that was used to treat the pigs. And they oftentimes don't even see the light of day. And because they're being raised like that, um, you know, they have to be fed uh, antibiotics and things like that to keep them healthy. Mm -hmm. We had actually um, people come to us and try to convince us that this was the pro progress, this is the better way to go. And if we, we wanted to stay competitive in the marketplace, we were going to have to, you know, build one of these on our farming operations. And um, my parents talked it over. And, you know, the reason my dad 
was farming was because he really enjoyed working outside with the animals the way that we'd been doing for decades. And uh, he couldn't imagine what it would be like to work inside one of those things. You can imagine the smell, the odors that um, emanate from those type of buildings. And my mother, she was more, more concerned about the pigs, whether or not they would like it. <laughs> So we, you know, we, we, we considered it and then just realized it was against our values. So um, we started getting docked at the marketplace uh, because we did not have contracts with uh, the markets and they were starting to contract out with just these um, big, big, confined animal feeding big. operations and we were having to compete with them. At one point, we brought our pigs to market and they docked meaning they um, penalized us because our pigs were considered too fat. Oh. Um, we were using more heritage breed hogs. Oh. We were using Berkshire Duroc and Chester White mixes, which created the best combination for flavor, hardiness, and the like. Whereas the ho hogs that are being raised in confined animal feeding operations were a standard white pig that um, really didn't have, they were, they were more concerned about uh, quantity than quality. And so I remember my father being very um, disappointed and um, offended that we were being penalized because he knew our pork was better. better. <laughs> yeah, so that's when we started looking for um, our own market. We realized that uh, things were changing and we were going to have to um, figure out our own niche market. And that's when we started working with Nyman Ranch. Mm -hmm. And they were working with, uh, they're based out of the San Francisco Bay Area at the time. And it was a very small operation with just Bill Nyman and a couple lamb ranchers. And they were looking for a good source of pork. Um, they were having a really difficult find, time finding one. And um, they met through some mutual friends my dad had through the Peace Corps. And uh, they were supplying Nyman Ranch with their lambs. And they felt that our values perfectly aligned with the values of Nyman Ranch. And, uh, you know, the rest was really history. Bill Nyman said to my father after meeting with him and talking about, uh, you know, some of the things we've been talking about here today, he said, why don't you just send me a sample and we'll see? Because if it doesn't taste good, no one's going to care. And I think a lot of times when we're talking about health, we forget that a part of pleasure in our life too is just the way things taste in our mouths. And that's, you know, something to not overlook. It's really important that food tastes really good and then it be nutrient rich and that it's sustaining our bodies. And so anyway, he dropped off the, the pork to uh, some of the best chefs in the country and let them decide which pork they would want to have. Wow. And so chefs like Alice Waters, um, Judy Wicks and the like all came back 100% they all wanted our pork and that was the beginning of the Nyman Ranch Pork Company. Um, demand really grew, people were identifying us but before it was a big thing. Uh, these chefs were identifying where the meat was coming from directly on their menu, which was wonderful. Word of mouth really was the best um, tool for us in the beginning and we had more and more people request more and more pork just like ours from Nyman Ranch and so we were able to bring in over 700 other independent family farmers who were raising their animals wow. in the same way, outdoors on pasture or deeply bedded pens, um, and never given any antibiotics. Their tails were not being docked, their teeth were not being clipped. Those are things that are typical in confined animal feeding operations. So. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of history from me. And I've been working in the food business on and off for the most of my life. I worked as a chef on a private jet for a, a little while. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then I did actually get hired by Nyman Ranch. And a lot of my work stemmed from working with chefs, doing some outreach and raising awareness across the country. Um, just knowing that if people knew some of the practices that were in place, in more conventional and in industrial raising practices, they would be more particular about the meat that they eat and chose to put in their body and to serve their families. 
Absolutely, absolutely. You, I totally agree with you. Like we really can tell what is good, what is not good, right? Not right. just me. Like we go to grocery, we go to farmers market, we buy those fresh uh, fruits. We just you put in our mouth. It's just so delicious. And then you go to grocery store, you find those same fruits, but they, it has been there for, for a while. And if you eat it, it's like tasteless, the same strawberries on. And right? so this is a freshness and uh, no chemicals. And it's just uh, that makes a huge difference. And that's also makes a huge difference to our health, right? The one we really put in our body. That's the, that's the thing that makes the, everything different. So um, it, how is the situation now? Do you think uh, like smaller farms, like your, your father's farm, is it easier now or is it more competitive now? What's this, where we are at now? I think we're still at a place where um, farmers are struggling to find those opportunities. You know, um, I think that uh, the statistics show that, um, industrially produced you know livestock is growing with leaps and bounds but of course out here in california some of the um wonderful things is that are that there are people here seem to be more concerned about these issues mm -hmm. um and recently uh, proposition 12 was passed which would um make it illegal to sell pork that is from any type of raising operation that would use gestation crates mm -hmm. and gestation crates um, particularly are, are inhumane for pigs they're just basically this it's a you know little rectangle the same size as the sow which mm -hmm. is a female pig and they're put in there and once they're pregnant they have to stay in there for the entirety of their pregnancy and once they're ready to give birth they're moved into another crate Wow. Um, that's a, a farrowing crate that has a little bit more room because her piglets will be in there with her too, but it's also pretty hard for her to move. But the gestation crates are really bad because this, uh, the sow can't even turn around. She can only stand up or sit down. And um, Temple Grandin, for example, has worked on these issues. Um, and we worked with her as well at Nyman Ranch and uh, Diane Halverson, she's a wonderful farm animal welfare expert and she's been a wonderful resource as well. These people have studied animals and their behaviors and what it's like um, for them inside of these industrial, industrial production facilities. And Temple has even suggested some minor changes that can improve their lives drastically. And so, I'm really proud of California for, you know, passing Prop 12, which will um, make it very difficult for uh, conventional farmers to sell uh, their pork when it's raised in such an inhumane way. So they'll have to change their operations. But I do see more and more opportunities. There are more and more companies and there are more and more people who have made their voices heard just through the decisions that they're making at the grocery store, at the mm -hmm. restaurants and things like that, which has created this niche market. Um, and like I said in the beginning, it was just our family, the Willis family farm that was supplying Nyman Ranch. And through um, word of mouth and um, through people really showing an interest and concern about where their food comes from and also wanting to have the most excellent tasting food um, they you know made that choice and therefore was a, we were able to grow our market and therefore uh, we were able to add new farmers to the point where they have over 750 mm -hmm. traditional family farmers who are raising their animals that way in this it, continue to raise their animals in the more traditional and humane way um, and they're able to do it without antibiotics because it is a more healthy way for the animal to live absolutely that's um, that's such so wonderful i applaud to you guys who are doing this and it's so important aspect even for our whole human being uh, yeah. society, you know, because uh, uh, back in the university, my major was uh, applied ethics. So uh, that is to address the importance, like not everything should be human-centered, you know, animal, right. animal rights, you know, we need to protect uh, 
our environment, all those things, all these factors need to be considered considered while we when the business are out there trying to make huge amount of money, you know. So it's just so important that we are working towards that better uh, direction to make our society better and our living conditions in the environment better for the future and for our next generations and next generations. So important. Thank you so much for that. So, um, so then we talked about eating meat um, is good, right? And, right, uh, and valuable it, source of vitamin B12. I think that's the only real source for uh, pure vitamin B12, you know? <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, so what are the things that we need to pay attention to while we consuming meat? Because earlier we we're talking about all those very concerning situations of raising animals, right? So while we, so what, what are the things we need to pay attention? I think more, it, you know, it's very confusing when you go to the grocery store. It's yeah, sometimes yeah. hard because there's all these different labels, you know, out there and they have so many different descriptors um, where they say, you know, um, USDA process verified, you know, what does that even really mean to somebody? Um, some of the best, so one of the best resources that I can recommend if somebody wanted to go to the website and look at what all these different labels mean, there are some wonderful nonprofit organizations out there who have simplified it and narrowed it down. And uh, one of my favorite resources, and this is also for beauty as well, for those of you who are interested in what's in your makeup, they do that as well. They break it down and what different brands have and what what's found in their makeup. Um, that's a sidebar, but um, <laughs> it's called the Environmental Working Group, ewg.org. Yes, it's, absolutely, it's an awesome website, yes. Yeah, and they have, you can click on whatever meat, seafood, beef, pork, bison, and then go down and look at what the different certifications mean. Um, the certifications that I really look for, um, Certified Humane is one that I've actually done some work with. Uh, they make sure that animals are not raised in confined animal feeding operations. Is number that a one. label, Certified Humane? Is a label actually? It's a label, Certified Humane. Like label that they will put on the, on the like meat, uh, uh, yes, they will. Actually, uh, a lot of farms, in, including Nyman Ranch, uh, because of the confusion at the grocery store, yep. one of the ways that you can tell how the meat, what type of quality it is, is if there is a third party label on it. And so um, all of these different farms and meat uh, companies work to differentiate themselves in the marketplace so you can know what you're paying for and one of the certifications is humane certified humane humane mm -hmm. yes and um that is really important another good really good one is that the american grass fed association mm -hmm. animal welfare approved which i i worked on their um, farm animal welfare program early in it in the very early days um USDA Organic Food Alliance, mm -hmm. certified so grass-fed. Oh, and the, a really good one is the Global Animal Partnership, and that's often referred to as GAP in their acronym. Mm -hmm. And that, that actually started at Whole Foods, and they have different steps for different levels. But Whole Foods really wanted to um, to set up some real strict certification standards for the meat that they would bring into their store. Mm -hmm. um, those things are really important to make sure that, you know, your animals, you know, are raised with plenty of access to outdoor pasture, um, that they're not given, you know, antibiotics, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and that they're slaughtered in a humane way as well. Right. A lot of people don't like to think about that, but that's a really important part of the overall process because you could be doing everything the right way and then send the animal off to market and have it not meet a very good end. So um, the best companies do care about those things. There um, are some studies show like the fear that the animal had in the end when they slaughtered the animals, the fear the animal had actually can pass along even you know, while we to human beings while consuming the meat. Yes. So 
so the way that it was handled when they, you know, that part is actually very important as we're saying just now. It is very important. And that's a really interesting aspect. What do they call that? Inherited trauma or something, or yeah. passed down trauma for the information. I know that's controversial as well, but I think it's important to consider. And also, um, if an animal is in fear when it's being slaughtered, it actually ruins the meat quality. They release um, different chemicals into their body because they're feeling that fear. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the technology today to basically eliminate a lot of that for animals. And I know Dr. Temple Grandin, a lot of her work has really focused on the slaughter part of things. And she has done some amazing work where, where you, if you watch um, any of her work, if you look at any of the work that she's done, animals mo are moved in in a very calm manner. No longer are they being you know, slapped around or whatever, mm -hmm. and they're able to move in as a group and um, they're, they lose consciousness in a more natural way before they're actually slaughtered so that, they, so that they don't feel fear. But it's really important to know, you know, to know these things. And the best way to do it is for looking at those third party labels from organizations that you know that you can trust. So they do actually audit the farms and make sure that they're following these guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's. Thank you so much for sharing those. These are very important. Like uh, what coach my clients always uh, like share with them how it, important it is to sh read the labels. No matter what you buy in the grocery store, even you just buy cereal, right? You read the labels, like read the ingredients. What it is really there, you know, instead of just trust, because sometimes they use fancy words, right? You think, oh, it's uh, it's healthy, but the way you read the ingredients, it's not really because they add lots of other unhealthy things in it. So it's the same thing as buying meat, right? Like the, the, the tips you just shared, if we pay attention to those things, and then, you know, we can have, uh, you know, better chances of uh, buying right. meat. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, that's why what you're doing is so important is just getting the word out there. Your, your, your videos are so informative and they really, really kind of break things down so it's not so complicated and make it easier for people to integrate more healthy options into their lifestyles. And you're just so inspiring, Sharon. And I just so can't much. emphasize enough just like what I'm just so um, impressed with the work that you're doing and I know you're helping a lot of people and I hope that some of the information I shared gets a little bit of people to think about where their meat comes from and it's really important you know people say well this costs more when you get meat from you know these high quality you know places or if you're getting all grass-fed beef it's a lot more expensive but my advice is you know we should really be eating less meat right but knowing where it came from. Yeah. So, you know, a really good, like if somebody wants to know like how big of a steak they should have, you can kind of look at the palm of your hand mm -hmm. and, you know, get an idea that your steak should probably be about that size. That size. Yes. Yeah. And you can eat like, you know, two nice servings of meat a week. And then it really doesn't cost more than if you're eating a lot of cheaply raised meat. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's so much better for you. And uh, it's very important that we eat the varieties of foods, right? All yes. foods, uh, not like, but we have this habit, like when we start eating one thing, we just constantly eat the same thing, same, same thing every day, all the time, yeah. for a month, until we get tired of it, that we switch. But it's important to remember, like we, like, throughout the whole week we change things around we add more stuff like really varieties for whole foods as we were talking about i think i really appreciate what you said is like we don't really need to eat meat every day or need a big piece of steak every day right right we, we just only <laughs> needed to eat a nice small size of good quality meat once a week or twice a week, you know, and then there we eat lots of vegetables, you know, under fresh fruits, under stuff that is much better chance for health than, you know, we stick to like big piece of meat every day. You know? Right. And I think America, as Americans, you know, a lot of times, and I grew up in the Midwest, so I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, but uh, we were always think of meat as the center of the plate. Yeah. And then you have your veggies and whatever else on the side. Mm -hmm. And really, that's kind of backwards. We really should have like a big amount of vegetables and leafy greens. Yeah. And we sh should, 
um, kind of see the meat as more of a condiment, you know, just yeah. to add more flavor or whatever to what you're serving. Yeah, it probably it should be separate. just like one fourth of the plate. Either it's meat or it's beans or other things, you know, as all kinds of seafood. It just should not be the whole plate, right? So the right. <laughs> vegetables, fruits, and the healthy fats, those should have been the items that they cover the majority part of the plate. And the, yeah protein we actually yeah like you said we used to think meat is the most important thing for us but studies show that like most of the times we are not short of protein we think <laughs> that we need to eat meat all the time but with our diet like uh, you know nowadays we we can get plenty of protein in many ways so yeah definitely we should uh, pay attention to the other way around, like animal veggies, vegetables, healthy fats, you know, those uh, home grades into our diet as well. Right. Oh my gosh. And you're such an inspiration. Like I am a sucker for a pastry and those are probably, that's probably the worst thing you could eat, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe not the worst. I could think of worse things even, but um, yeah, it's so, so much more important to eat, make sure we're getting enough vegetables leafy greens and things like that yeah. um, and then just make sure you get really good quality meat yes yes absolutely thank you so much Juan. this has been so interesting and it's so inspiring and i really appreciate the all the work you and your family have been doing this is just so important and not just the for the food we eat is just for the better society environment you know i think it's a it's a huge one we think about it you know, you know from the long run from the future because everything starts with the mindset right if we right. start thinking about oh we do need to treat our animals better way and more humane way and then there are things will start changing and get better and it's going to benefit us and benefit many many generations afterwards that's right well thank you so much for having me this was such a wonderful conversation and um i I really appreciate it. Thank you. So if, we, if people want to follow you on uh, uh, social media, where they can find you? Oh, you can find me at Willis Farms. Um, and you can also find me, I do have a YouTube channel. I don't have a lot out there, um, but I do have different videos that I've liked that I think that are very uh, good resources on all of these topics. And um, so yeah, at Willis Farms on, Twitter and on Instagram and I'm Sarah Willis on Facebook and uh, and uh, and on YouTube as well.